The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this lunch and lecture. Today's topic, eating low on that glycemic list for better health, weight loss, and a healthier you. Your presenter, Rebecca Kirby, MD, MSRD. Howdy, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Center on this beautiful fall football weather day. How many of y'all been watching a lot of football? Okay, well we'll try to make a lot of first downs and not punt too much today. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about carbohydrates. And more specifically, we're going to talk about the classification system called the glycemic index and glycemic load. And we're going to discuss the health benefits of the carbohydrates that are classified in this system. And we're going to also discuss a little bit about the, how to avoid the pitfalls with all the information out there about the glycemic index. And we're going to look at the healthiest way to approach uh, this carbohydrate system. Okay. Well, <clears throat> carbohydrates have gotten a lot of publicity lately. They're sort of the bad boys of the macronutrients these days, you know. Used to be fats, uh, now it's carbohydrates. But actually, we, we need them. They're useful. They're our primary energy source in the body. Not proteins, not fats, but carbohydrates. You get four calories for every gram. And also, probably even more importantly, they're the brain's favorite fuel. Um, the brain requires 100 to 150 grams of glucose a day. It doesn't accept substitutes. Uh, and one of the things that glucose can do, it can spare protein. Uh, if you're eating enough carbohydrates, your proteins will be used to go do things that proteins do, like build muscle. They won't have to be used as energy. Um, and if you're very active, you can draw on carbohydrates that your body has socked away as a reserve fuel. Uh, it's what we call glycogen. Okay, well, where do we find carbohydrates? Well, they're virtually in all plant foods. And there's one animal food that has carbohydrates, and that's milk. Um, that's the lactose sugar in milk. Other animal foods, pretty zilch on carbohydrates. Now, if you eat a carbohydrate food that is still a whole food, you do get some protein, you get some fiber, and you get lots of essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients. And that's going to be kind of the thrust of how to study the glycemic index and the glycemic load is avoiding those refined carbohydrates that are stripped of their nutrients uh, and don't have much but calories in them. And, and when it comes to the amount of carbohydrate in your diet, it, it can be very much a personal preference. Uh, diets are not an all-size-fits-everybody or one-size-fits-all type of regimen. And um, even the um, institutes of medicine that have put together these recommendations for us allow a fairly large play of how many percent of our calories we want uh, for our optimal health from carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So you can see uh, it's recommended that about 45 to 65% of our calories come from carbohydrates. But what's more importantly is the quality of the carbohydrate, which is what we're going to really get down to today. And you might notice the, the fourth recommendation down there, fiber. Uh, they also recommend 25 grams of fiber for women and uh, 35 to 38 grams for men. That, that's quite a bit. It's one of those things that uh, unless you're eating whole foods and pretty low on the glycemic uh, list, you're, you're not going to get much of. Uh, and then again, they reiterate that you need about 130 grams of carbohydrates to provide the glucose for the brain. Uh, the brain will use ketones if it has to during starvation or during a, an excessively low carbohydrate type diet. Okay, so let's talk first about what are carbohydrates because there's a lot of kind of confusion about sugars and all. Sugars are sort of a bad, they sort of have a bad name, but they encompass a lot of things. We used to think of carbohydrates as either simple or complex, and the simples were the sugars. And they're saccharides. They're either a one saccharide unit called a monosaccharide, or they're a disaccharide unit, which is two stuck together. 
Um, and then you have the much more complex molecules. Those are your starches, where you have long chains of glucose. And that starch is a storage component in, in plant foods. That's what the plant uses to break down for energy. In humans, that starch is called glycogen, and that's what we store in muscles in our liver for also uh, energy. And, um, and then it gets, gets really interesting. <laughs> you get into the fibers. And fibers um, are so complex that I just put down cellulose and hemicellulose because there's like a gazillion strange names that all encompass the, the different kinds of fibers, and they're, they're studying lots about them. But, but what's important to us is some of our understanding about fibers that are insoluble and soluble. Because if you look at the insoluble fibers, that's the, the fairly undigested stuff from uh, the fiber in vegetables and the fiber in whole grains. That's, that's the brand. Its, it's <coughs> benefit is bulking up and helping with bowel motility. Then we have the water-soluble fibers, which are the things in oats, fruits, barley, and beans, and they can be anything like pectins, gums, and mucilages. I love that name, but it just makes you think of all the slimy, you know, kind of slimy stuff in oats and barley. Uh, well, those are water-soluble um, fibers, and they have health benefits as well. So those are the, that's the fiber family, uh, the complex carbohydrates. What we might want to talk for just a second about is what are the sugars, because there's a lot of sugars that we have in our foods, and we talk all about them, and uh, who the heck are they? Well, our, our monosaccharides are the most simple of sugars, and you see glucose is one of those. And, these, and the other names you may see for glucose is dextrose, same thing, uh, or blood sugar. That's, our blood sugar is glucose. Then the other simple sugar is fructose. It's fruit sugar. And then galactose. Poor galactose doesn't get a nickname. Um, and then disaccharides are when you have two of these monosaccharides together. Uh, two glucoses stuck together as maltose. And then sucrose is our table sugar. And that's a glucose and a fructose stuck together. And then lactose is our milk sugar. And it's a glucose and a galactose molecule. So those, that's the sugar family. Okay, now, um, what our body's goal is when, it's, when we eat carbohydrates, it's to get down to those simple units, those monosaccharides like glucose, because that's what it uses for energy. The brain wants it. Uh, it wants to store it away in our muscles. Um, so digestion of carbohydrates is, is very involved um, so that the body can get down to those basic units that it uses. And I just wanted to kind of go over it briefly to, to start with, this is something we kind of forget about doing, um, and that is digestion for carbohydrates actually starts in the mouth. So when you're worried about digestion problems, you need to remember, first of all, to chew your food um, because there's a amylase enzyme in your saliva that helps to start breaking down the carbohydrates. And, and anything that you see that's uh, a name that has an ASE in the in, on the end, that means it's an enzyme. Enzymes are just proteins that help, uh, in this case, break down uh, bigger, bigger molecules. So remember, chew your food, just like your mom said. Um, and then when it gets to the, when the, your food gets to the stomach, it's very acidic. Uh, that's where proteins start being broken down by the acid in the stomach, and uh, those that salivary amylase falls apart. So it doesn't work for you there. Uh, but then when you get to the small intestine, we have carbohydrate aces. That means enzymes that digest carbohydrates, and there's a bunch of them secreted by the pancreas. And um, then there's actually uh, enzymes on the surface of our small intestines that help to break down uh, the carbohydrates. And the large intestine, for most part, is just kind of uh, helping the fiber move through, reabsorb some water. But now we know there's a lot of activity with bacterial enzymes that also can be um, helpful in the large intestine. 
So, digestion um, is, is fairly complex. We just kind of hit the high points on what carbohydrates doing, but all this time, you, you know, you eat foods that are a combination of things, so fat digestion, protein digestion are going on at the same time. Well, that really affects your carbohydrate uh, digestion, and anything that affects carbohydrate carbohydrate digestion is going to affect your blood sugar. So how digestible the starch is is going to make a difference in how these uh, carbohydrate foods affect your blood sugar, uh, how the starch interacts with the protein in the food, uh, the amounts of fat, sugar, and fiber that are in a food. Uh, there's things that bind up the starch, and that makes a difference in how things are digested, whether they're dry, liquid, a paste, finely ground, cooked. Um, that makes a difference in how the starch and sugars are available. And then the combination of foods is always helpful. It doesn't really, I mean, no matter how high the glycemic index is for a food, if you eat it with some protein and fat, it will blunt that response. So combination foods are very important. Okay, because once upon a time, we just thought about carbohydrates as simple and complex. Um, but what somebody observed was that a lot of these so-called complex carbohydrates raise the blood sugar differently from other complex carbohydrates. So obviously they weren't quite acting all the same. And so this researcher in Canada decided, okay, well, let's study them and let's classify them. And the glycemic index was born, and that was back in 1981. So it has been around a while. But the latest development, which is very helpful, is in 1997, some Harvard researchers said, okay, um, we eat a different amount of carbohydrate uh, in our servings of foods, different from the, what they studied for the glycemic index. Let's calculate something that's called a glycemic load that indicates actual carbohydrates that you're eating with a meal. So. Um, the reason of all, all this interest is because all these carbohydrate foods, uh, after they've digested, they have an effect on the blood sugar, and that's why it's called the glycemic effect. So in a nutshell, a carbohydrate-containing food has a glycemic effect, and that's de defined as how fast and how high the blood sugar goes up and how quickly the body responds and bringing the blood sugar back to normal. Or said another way, it's the effect of a person's food on their blood glucose and their insulin response. Because if you have blood glucose going up, insulin comes out to take care of it. So the glycemic index was born. <laughs> and um, there's a crowd of researchers out in Australia, and they're the ones who have done the bulk of the tests on foods to come up with the glycemic index. And so there's a ranking system that they created. And this is how they tested all those foods. They got volunteers to come and eat uh, a 50 gram portion of a carbohydrate food. Now, um, it had to be digestible carbohydrates. So what that means is they subtract out what we understand is the fiber content of a food. So this is just your digestible carbohydrate. So these folks got to eat a 50 gram portion and then over two hours they studied their blood sugar uh, and measured that. And then the volunteers got to come back on another day and eat the control food and see what their blood sugar was with that. And the, the control or reference food was a 50 gram portion of glucose. Because glucose, you know, if you've ever taken a glucose tolerance test, that's the stuff they give you, goes straight to the blood sugar, because that's what blood sugar is, it's glucose. So um, then they compared how that person responded to the glucose, which is considered like a 100% response, and how they responded with that test food. And then they gave it a number. Uh, this, it was the response of the test food relative to the control or reference food. For example, a baked potato, it has a glycemic index of 85. 
So that means it's the blood sugar response was 85% of what the response was to pure glucose. I got a picture. Picture says a thousand words. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a low glycemic index food. It's kidney beans. Any kind of bean, lentils, that, that, they fall pretty much in the same category. Nice low glycemic index. Because you can see with the reference food, uh, which is glucose, zoom, 100% response with the blood sugar um, over the course of two hours. And they actually calculate this area under the curve. And then kidney beans, just 28% of the response to glucose. So the glycemic index for kidney beans is 28. So that's where that number came from. Now, <clears throat> that's the glycemic index. It's testing the quality of carbohydrates in these foods because they're all 50 gram portions. It's the same amount. All right, well, we don't exactly eat 50 gram portions of certain carbohydrate foods when we sit down to eat. Um, when For these, this kidney bean test, 50 grams of carbohydrate means the volunteers were eating about a cup and a quarter of kidney beans. That's, that's a pretty serious serving. Uh, <laughs> okay, but for carrots, for them to get 50 grams of, of, of uh, digestible carbohydrates from a carrot, the subject had to eat four and a half cups. You know, and most people don't sit down to four and a half cups of carrots at a meal, or even a day for that matter. Okay, so that's why the crowd in 1997 said, okay, we got to take these numbers and translate them you know, to what people are actually doing, you know, what you eat in a meal. That's the glycemic load. Okay, so glycemic load. All right, so obviously the amount of carbohydrate that 50 grams uh, is for foods varies. So they converted the glycemic index to the glycemic load, and they did a little math, um, and they took the glycemic index and they multiplied it times the grams of carbohydrates like you would eat uh, in a reasonable amount of carrots for, for a, a serving, which is um, about a half a cup. Servings, we'll talk a little bit more about servings. It gets a little gray, uh, but roughly. And um, so that's the glycemic load. And it gets kind of confusing because you see a lot of stuff out there, glycemic index, and maybe you'll see glycemic load, and the numbers are different. The numbers for glycemic index are, uh, you look at numbers 70s, 50s, things like that. The glycemic load, you're looking at numbers that are 20s and 10s. It's, it's a different animal. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so let's, let's have a science break here. They did um, an interesting little research project to see if, if they varied the amount of the glycemic load that people were eating, <clears throat> if they would see the same variation uh, incrementally of their insulin response. Because, you know, after you have glucose shoot up, your blood glucose shoot up, you have insulin come out to take care of it. So they, <laughs> these test subjects... Um, I, I guess they're not wearing out their welcome. I, they must get new people every time. Uh, they fed, fed them either one slice of white bread, two slices, three slices, four slices, or six slices. That was one group. And then another group got the equivalent carbohydrate in the six slices of bread and some other things, which was like a, a liter and a third of orange juice, uh, let's see, the baked beans, that turns, well, let's see, uh, there's 500 and something grams in a pound, so they got to eat a pound, over a pound of baked beans. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's about two to three bananas, kind of depending on the size. And then, <laughs> then there was the jelly bean group, uh, and that's about uh, a little less than a half a cup of jelly beans. So, they measured all these, you know, glucose and insulin response curve. 
And, and they did find that as they incrementally increased the amount of this uh, carbohydrate that they were studying in people, they got an incrementally increase in the insulin demand. So what, what that tells us is it's not so much the amount of carbohydrate, it's the quality of carbohydrate that's going to affect your insulin. Um, and that what, what your insulin is doing has a lot to do with disease risk. Um, because what, what happens is if we have a lot of insulin hanging around, um, we're going to have a lot more inflammation. Uh, it's a risk factor for um, what we call pre-diabetes. You, you may have heard of insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome. Um, and then that is a risk factor, of course, for diabetes, heart disease, uh, obesity. So having all this insulin around, um, you know, insulin has a job, but if we are constantly eating high glycemic load foods, and as they incrementally increased it, they saw m much more demand uh, for insulin by the body. So that was telling them that, you know, the kind of carbohydrates and keeping it uh, at a, at a um, studied level was really helpful. So let's, let's look at the numbers. Okay, glycemic index. I wish they'd just actually call it something entirely different, so you, but it's GI and GL. So <laughs> glycemic index range are the big numbers. So when you see something that's glycemic index, it will be these numbers. Anything that has a number higher than 70 is high. Medium is like over 55 and under 70, and low is 55, 50, or less. Okay, that's good, the index. Okay, then you take into account the amount of actual carbohydrate you're eating. So they t the glycemic index times the amount of carbohydrate you eat in a serving, that's glycemic load. Okay, numbers are different. 10 or less is a nice low glycemic load food. Uh, medium is over 10, under 20, and high glycemic load is over 20. Memorize those numbers. <laughs> There's a quiz later in about two minutes. Okay, now, <clears throat> when they do the glycemic index, um, just, just want to uh, reiterate this, it has to be in carbohydrate-containing foods. And, and, of course, not all foods have carbohydrates. Um, that's your meats, your fish, your eggs. Uh, and then there's some foods, like avocados, that are pretty much don't have a whole lot of carbohydrates, so they don't do a glycemic index on that. And, and uh, what's not written down here is most vegetables. Vegetables are so low carbohydrate, you know, for the volume that you generally eat um, that they just don't do the glycemic index on a lot of them. Not true of the starchy vegetables, you know, like your winter squashes and your sweet potatoes and your corn and all, um, but most vegetables, you know, like zucchini squash and your broccoli, and um, they just, they have so little, you know, they have about maybe two grams of carbohydrate often for like a little half cup. They often don't even do the glycemic load. So when you when you see things with glycemic index and glycemic load, they're not necessarily going to have a lot of your vegetables on there. They've already been given the go-ahead. Okay, now, let's digest this little list here for a sec. Helps us to kind of understand the difference between the glycemic index and the glycemic load. Because you, you can, when, when you're looking at the glycemic index, they'll say that there are certain foods that have a low glycemic index. Uh, well, it turns out they have a high glycemic load. And there are certain foods that, oh, they have a high glycemic index. Well, they turn out to have a low glycemic load. Okay, case in point. High glycemic index. The GI for watermelon is 90. Uh, that's over 70. So that's a big number. Okay, well, there's just not much available carbohydrate in a serving of watermelon. And uh, like 10 little, 10 little grams there in about a cup and a quarter. So its glycemic load turns out, if you're eating a cup and a quarter, to be 8. Well, that's under 10. So that's a nice low glycemic load food, even though the glycemic index 
looks like it would, you know, you'd have to run out and shoot up with insulin or something. Okay. <laughs> now, whole wheat bread, uh, it, it also has a high glycemic index. But if you eat one slice, it's got a very moderate glycemic load. We're shooting for stuff 10 and under for a nice glycemic load. And the more fibery it is, I'm sure that's a word, uh, <laughs> you know, it has seeds and it has uh, nuts and it has extra bran or oat bran or something, uh, the, the lower the glycemic load will be. Because all those things take a lot of activity in our gut to digest. Uh, popcorn is sort of interesting. It's got kind of that medium uh, glycemic index, but two cups of it is a really low glycemic load. Uh, shredded wheat, it kind of falls in the middle. It's got a very high glycemic index, but the glycemic load, is, it's over 10, but it's under 20. So it's what we call a medium glycemic load. That's for a half a cup. Okay, now, you know, potatoes. Uh, have have gotten branded because the Idaho potato because they do have a high glycemic index. And it turns out they also have a high glycemic load. Uh, and I was really happy to see that new potatoes weren't quite so bad. Uh, the little new potatoes, their glycemic index is over 50, uh, but when you calculate the glycemic load, it's it's over 10, but it's under 20. You know. And and they kind of kind of the same with sweet potatoes, although uh, a little bit more happening there because there's so uh, so much carbohydrates there. And bananas, most whole fruits will be low glycemic load foods. Most. You got to eliminate the starchy guys, and so banana being our main starchy uh, fruit here, uh, kind of a medium glycemic index, but also a medium glycemic load. So you kind of have to be careful about too many bananas. All righty, now <clears throat> there are foods that have a reputation for low glycemic index. <clears throat> and I've seen little things say, you know, eat low glycemic uh, index, so eat, eat more pasta or, or rice. Well, the problem with that is, <clears throat> here's, here's your spaghetti and macaroni. It is sort of a low glycemic index food because it's under 50. However, th there's a lot of carbohydrate in a cup, and most of us Truly, you know, when we eat spaghetti, we eat at least a cup. Um, it's it's a high glycemic load food because over it's over 20. It's not only not under 10; it's over 20. So, <clears throat> you know, those are things you're going to proceed with caution with. Um, and and rice of the rices, uh, I hear a lot about. Well, basmati rice is a great rice. Uh, it has this sort of medium glycemic index, but boy. It, it has quite a starchy glycemic load. So, it, like I said, you know, they, they talk about great glycemic index foods, but they may not be so great glycemic load. And that's what we're eating. You know, we're not eating those 50 gram test portions. We're eating, you know, a portion. <clears throat> okay, now then there's some things like these last four that have these nice low, and we get lower, lower, and lower glycemic indexes, and thank goodness, <laughs> they have low glycemic loads, so they're, they're a, you know, a green light. A go ahead. And I put carrots down there. Carrots got this funny reputation of being a sugary food. Well, of course they do taste sweet. And <clears throat> you know what happened? Um, it was an error on the part of the investigators. And they printed the error, you know, on their huge list of stuff. Uh, a popular book picked it up. And once that book got out, this became urban legend that carrots were a sugary, high glycemic food. Well, <clears throat> I guess the researchers looked at that book and they went, eat. And they went back to the lab and they looked at their data and they said, Oh, sorry, that was a misprint. Uh, so your, your carrots have not only a low glycemic index, but if you ate like a bit, pretty big carrot there, uh, you wouldn't get that much 
available carbohydrates. So look at that. I mean, that's a glycemic load of one. So carrots change. Oh, actually, cooked carrots are not much much worse. Uh, <clears throat> and I say worse. Their their glycemic load doesn't go up much. But the interesting thing about cooking things, you know, because a lot of people are really interested in trying to do as many raw foods as possible, there are some foods where cooking makes the nutrients more available. Uh, carrots is a good example because, you know, they, they have really tough cell walls, um, hence they need a lot of chewing. And um, if you cook a carrot, it already starts the breakdown process of that cell wall and you'll get more beta carotene out of it if it's a cooked carrot versus a raw carrot. So. Uh, and it doesn't really affect the glycemic load that much. Okay, so you've got to be a very studied person when you're looking for your glycemic index information. Now, this is the index. Uh, because the long list that's printed in the books is very often glycemic index. And the, the crowd is out in Australia. And to tell you the truth, a lot of the foods are Australian, Canadian, uh, not, they're not always uh, U.S. foods. Um, in fact, I found a whole page devoted to the glycemic uh, index of um, digestive biscuits. <laughs> now, have, have, has, has anybody eaten a digestive? Oh, they're lovely. But over, <laughs> they're a cookie, actually, over in uh, Great Britain. Um, it's kind of a cookie that's whole meal, has, has a lot of bran in it and doesn't have a lot of sugar. Um, so, you know, when you come across that, you, you know, if you didn't know what a digestive was, you wouldn't know what you're, you're reading on. So a lot of these are foods that are, you know, more Great Britain, Australia, Canada. Um, and and the, the folks out in Australia are doing like the mother list. Uh, but there are other auxiliary lists. People, researchers will uh, publish papers that will have like ethnic foods uh, that they want to know the glycemic range on. And um, I've also found that on some of the, the glycemic index foods, I'll, uh, you, you click on to uh, a little more information about it. And it didn't turn out that it was part of a research paper where they tested it on diabetic folks. Well, that may not quite be the same response for people who have normal blood sugar. So a few little perils there. And there is a fair amount of variability. Um, what, what a lot of uh, the folks who try to use the glycemic index data will do is they'll take like a mean of eight different studies of peaches because there's that much variability. Uh, between, you know, these are people eating these things, so you know how different we all are. It's that biochemical individuality. Um, so it varies a lot among the test subjects. And the latest thing I read was they tested different things uh, over and over with the same subjects, and they found even the same person had some variability in how they handled that food uh, with their blood sugar. So. It's not a perfect science. It's just a tool. And we're going to try to figure out the best way to you know, use this tool. Now, um, glycemic load, where we're getting down to the more practical part of the glycemic index, the amount that we actually would eat in a sitting, um, I found the serving sizes that they used to calculate glycemic load weren't necessarily the USDA approved serving sizes, like uh, a cup of spaghetti. Well, a, a true serving size is considered a half a cup of spaghetti. So frankly, a cup of sp spaghetti is a little more realistic. So I, you know, I was kind of OK with the, the sizes that they had used for the glycemic load. Uh, but just you know, caution that it's not going to be the diabetic exchange system size of serving. Um, now, and, and again, you have to remember that they're calculating available carbohydrate from the food, not the total carbohydrate, because total carbohydrate will also take into account fiber. And fiber's uh, not kind of like a free food. <laughs> it's supposed to go through without contributing much to uh, calories and blood sugar response. Uh, and actually, this is pretty critical right here. These, a lot of these glycemic index uh, studies are now starting to 
do them on packaged foods and uh, all sorts of like conglomerate foods, and um, so so that little so that you know food makers can put ah a low glycemic sticker on their food. Okay, well those may be foods that aren't necessarily very nutritious. So you've got to remember that this is a certain measurement. It doesn't mean if it's a low glycemic index branded food that it's necessarily a nutritious food. You still got to keep the whole foods aspect in mind. You know, where are you going to get your most nutrients? You're going to get your most nutrients from the most from the least manipulated type of foods, whole foods. And you know, the real advantage of working off of a low glycemic list is you're going to get lots of fiber. You know, the 25 grams for women and the 35 grams for men that are considered the healthy standard to shoot for, the average American gets 11 grams of fiber. And that's, that's a pretty good average person because I've seen a lot less. Um, so eating on the glycemic load is going to give you lots of good fiber. And we know there's a lot of really good science, lots of bulky science, uh, behind how healthy uh, fiber is in the diet. And also, if you eat low on the glycemic load, uh, you're going to get lots of fruits and vegetables. And we know it helps prevent cancer, it helps to lower blood pressure. You may have heard of the DASH diet, where they expect people to eat like 10 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Well, it lowers their blood pressure. And the, the important thing is it's also going to help control hunger. When you control hunger, you control weight. Okay, so all these nice things that a low glycemic load can do um, is it moderates uh, that insulin response. Okay, it lowers triglycerides and C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is an index of inflammation. You like that low. Um, it increases HDL. That's the good cholesterol. Uh, decreases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And of course, if you've got nice low triglycerides, high HDL, and a low C-reactive protein, you've decreased your risk for uh, cardiovascular disease. And delays hunger, increases satiety. Okay, so this was an interesting study, just hot off the press, where they fed a group of obese young adults a low glycemic load versus a low fat diet. So the low glycemic load diet had about 40% of their carbohydrates, uh, or 40% of the calories from carbohydrates, 35% from fats. The low fat diet crowd uh, had 20% of their calories from fats, 55% from carbohydrates. And the range of calories from fats from 20% to 35% is still considered within the healthy guidelines. And of course, what that meant is both groups were getting the same amount of protein in their diet. Um, and they, they actually followed them for 18 months. And what they found was lower triglycerides and higher HDLs. And those folks who had a high insulin response, these, these are folks who were insulin resistant when they entered the study. That means high insulin levels anyway. Uh, they lost significantly more weight and body fat over the people who just had okay insulin levels. So that means it's a real win-win for people who have prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, because you're going to have more benefit. You're not only going to get lower triglycerides and higher HDL, you're going to get more weight loss and more body fat loss. Okay. well. The culprit is, is your high glycemic index foods, you know, get that blood sugar up, they get that insulin up, and it stimulates the body's response to make glycogen, which is all those little glucose molecules stuck together. It stores away in the liver for energy, and also stimulates the body to make more fat and not to break down what fat you've got. Uh, and then after all that insulin's taking care of all the glucose, you feel hypoglycemic, and then you're hungry again. So, so high glycemic foods, you know, it's kind of a vicious yo-yo cycle here. Um, <clears throat> so they studied appetite. And this time they had um, obese teenage boys. And they gave them three different 
uh, meals. They all had the same amount of calories. They just had different glycemic um, loads. So they had a low glycemic, which was a vegetable omelet with fruit. Then their medium glycemic meal um, was stone, the steel cut oatmeal. And then their high glycemic was instant oatmeal. Okay, and uh, what they found, if, if it was the high glycemic, they got the high insulin response, uh, a bunch of glucose uptake in the liver, the muscle, and the fat, and inhibition of fat breakdown, uh, which, and then that reactive hypoglycemia. And this little caveat here, subjects after their high glycemic meal, they studied you know, what they ate for the rest of the day, they all ate more because they were hungry. Okay, nurses' health study. Boy, they've, uh, they've plowed a lot of data out of all these nurses that they've been following for years. And this was pretty interesting. I mean, they're looking at 65,000, so you can't say this is a small sub, uh, study group. Um, and they found that over, they, that what they did is they looked at the diets. And, and they, you know, sort of put them out by quartiles. You know, these people who are eating the low glycemic, kind of medium, and then the high. Okay, those who were eating the highest glycemic diets had the, a 37% increased risk of diabetes, developing diabetes over the next six years because they've been following these people for a long time. Okay, so where did their high glycemic index foods came from, come from? White bread, white potatoes, white rice, and carbonated beverages. And then, and then the, the group uh, that had particularly high glycemic load and low fiber had a 50%. They had twice the, the risk of developing diabetes. So lots of good health benefits from eating low on the glycemic load. Okay, well, um, picture says a thousand words. Here's a pyramid that sort of sums it all up. Um, if you're looking for low glycemic load foods, make the mainstay of your diet non-starchy vegetables and whole fruits. Juices don't count. <laughs> whole fruits, because you've got to have the protein and the fiber that's in the fruit. The juice is just juice. Um, and then enjoy more nuts. And, and seeds and beans, you know, all, all those little beans like kidneys and garbanzos and black beans. Um, there's tons of them out there, lentils, black-eyed peas, uh, and then seeds, sunflower seeds, nuts, your almonds, your pecans. Um, actually, protein foods don't have a glycemic, so if you're eating low on the glycemic, protein is like a, like a zero for you. Um, tofu, which is actually uh, soybeans. Soybeans have a very low glycemic load, and when they coagulate that protein to make tofu, it's, it's a, it's a non-glycemic food. In other words, it doesn't really do anything to the blood sugar. It acts just like 100% protein. Um, the, the whole milk dairy group, even though dairy is the one animal food that has carbohydrate, um, it, it has a low glycemic load. And then, you know, enjoy uh, whole grain cereals. You know, you can do whole grain pasta. You can do your steel cut oatmeal. Um, you can do your dense whole grain breads. But those are a little bit further up the pyramid because most of them have a medium glycemic load. These guys right here are low glycemic load. Oops, these guys right here. And then eat less of the, uh, these are your white potatoes, uh, your sweet roll, and your white bread. <clears throat> For a while, uh, speaking of white bread, instead of using the 50 gram glucose, for their reference food when they were determining the glycemic index, they just gave them white bread. So, so it had like a 100% uh, blood sugar response. Okay. So the, the glycemic index people who are doing a lot of the, the work, uh, most of the work, they actually have a logo. And they say, you know, follow our logo uh, if you want to be reassured that this is getting, you know, our scientific testing. And what their website says 
This is glycemic index, remember. Glycemic index foods that are low are, of course, fruits um, and vegetables, not potatoes, your, your beans, uh, your yogurt and milks, nuts, your whole grain uh, with lots of oats, barley, or psyllium seed, and real, you know, hearty breads. And so what you want to do is you want to limit these high glycemic choices. These are things made with your white flour, like pancakes, your white potato. Look at the difference between your glycemic load, this is load, of a serving of a baked potato and a serving of a sweet potato. Uh, white rice, brown rice is, old, is better. Couscous is just little balls of white flour, so that's not very good. Uh, <laughs> And uh, some, some, see, remember, under 10, low glycemic load, over 20, high glycemic load. <clears throat> did a little bit better with the fibery stuff. Um, spaghetti, it's still kind of a medium thing, but whole wheat's a little bit better. Uh, puffed rice cakes, eh, I just don't sound very good anyway. Uh, <laughs> And uh, crackers, you know, if you got some fiber, like your rye, rye crackers that are nothing but ground up rye meal, you know, you're going to be much better off. Now, I'm just going to breeze through this for a minute. <clears throat> this was the idea about servings being a little bit different. The, when, you, when you see a lot of, like our USDA food guide pyramid, and they talk about, you know, eat so many servings of grains a day, Okay, that all, the serving size was born out of the diabetic exchange system. So they've manipulated serving size to represent roughly 15 grams of carbohydrate in a serving. So that's why you see, you know, like a half a cup of pasta. Well, nobody eats a half a cup of pasta or a half a cup of rice. Well, that's because they're trying to, to, to manipulate these things so it's easier for people to exchange you know, their carbohydrate list. <clears throat> so that's where that all came from. And um, it's going to be a little bit different with your glycemic load. I think it's going to be actually a little more realistic. But things like your, your fruits and vegetables and your salad greens and your cooked vegetables and your non-starchy fruits, you don't really have to worry about your portion sizes. Kind of consider those free foods because they're low glycemic load foods. They're not going to rock and roll the blood sugar. If it's starchy, you know, like your corn, bananas, peas, winter squash, or your spuds there, <clears throat> it's a different thing. And uh, they, uh, again, along the same line, the 15 gram of carbohydrate per serving, that's why you see that uh, serving of beans and all is usually considered a half a cup. But since they're low glycemic load, you can enjoy more. So what you want to do is have a diversity of fruits, uh, whole fruits, and non-starchy vegetables um, that are low on the glycemic load. Uh, you want to be aware of your portion sizes. You can still overeat anything. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> choose healthy fats. Uh, those are like in your nuts. And uh, don't forget to drink water, exercise, and enjoy your food. Now, uh, I do have, if you'll pull out your little list of um, a, a kind of rough glycemic load. This is your, your little take home piece of paper here that uh, is ranked on the, t on the front page is um, all the ones under 10 that I could squeeze on one page that are kind of things that we generally eat. Uh, and they go from the you know, lowest number, which is hummus <coughs> and soybeans and your good old carrot and peanuts and beans, uh, <coughs> down to where you're finding a few grains that are you know, still kind of low glycemic load, like cornmeal boiled. If you're from the south, you know what that is. <laughs> it's called cornmeal mush. Uh, whole grain breads, rye crisps, things like that. But one of the things you might observe on this side is the, the nice low glycemic load of whole fruits that I emphasized again. It, and you, I put in parentheses afterwards what happens when you just juice. <clears throat> if it's grapefruit or tomato, eh, you can get away with a juice with still low glycemic load. But orange juice shoots the glycemic load out of low into medium load, uh, apple juice uh, gets up there a bit too. So you really have a nice low glycemic load if you eat 
the, the fruit. And you notice vegetables aren't here much because they're, they're very, very low glycemic load. They don't even bother to test them. But this, <clears throat> this sums up, you know, that beans are great, nuts are great. They actually have fair, fairly small amount of available carbohydrate because they're so fibrous and have protein and fat. Uh, and your whole fruits. Um, and then it shows you also about some dairy products. Okay, now if you flip over to the back side, um, you'll see the things that are the moderate glycemic load. They're under 20, but they're over 10. And you've got your more dense uh, grains, you know, your cracked wheat, your, your steel cut oatmeal, you know, branny things, um, the whole grains like in the spaghetti or the cereal. Um, and then it sort of starts getting, the numbers start getting a little higher uh, as you get towards the corn, just the plain old corn and spaghetti and rice. And then it tips over into the high glycemic load, which is basically your, your white flour stuff, uh, really refined cereals uh, like the flakes and uh, those little balls of wheat flour called couscous, uh, the macaroni, um, and there's the good old baked potato. You know, it's, it's just a high glycemic load of food. That's all we can say. Uh, and anything that's a, a white flour concoction like uh, bagels or pancakes. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of how to approach this. And if you want to really digest these lists, um, this is the website of these folks. Uh, this is one of the principal researchers now, and she's got a couple of books. One of them has the glycemic index in it. Uh, and this website has their, their list. You know, it goes on for pages and pages and pages. So it's, it's there accessible. Uh, this was like the original publication they, they came out with back in 2002, and then they had to you know, print some corrections, kind of like with carrots and stuff. Uh, and this, this website here, this fellow does a great job uh, of talking about diabetes diets or, or diets for folks with diabetes. And he has also this, this list uh, with much more information about available carbohydrates. So that, that was very useful. Um, and um, this, is, this is just a book that we're going to have available um, that is pretty good if you want to eat sort of a moderate carbohydrate uh, diet. Kind of gives you a lot of information about that using low glycemic load uh, foods. So, so when you go out there and you're studying things, remember you're really wanting to look at glycemic load. And you're wanting in your own diet to think, vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, non-starchy whole fruits, your beans, your nuts, your seeds, um, and then whole grains, really dense stuff, and, you know, sometimes, but less frequently, you know, the white floury stuff and white potatoes and all those higher glycemic load foods. So, good luck. <laughs> and thank you. Well, we'll take questions. <laughs> On the glycemic load, is it linear? Like if a cup is a glycemic load of nine, would two cups be 18? You know, that I never saw anything with response to that. But if you take the glycemic index and you multiply it times the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating, that it would increase that number. So that is the precaution that portions still do count for something. Yeah. Why is uh, steel cut oatmeal better than just plain regular oatmeal? Well, it's, it, if you've ever encountered them, they're, they're pretty much just the oat all cracked up instead of flaked. Uh, I don't, if you've had cracked wheat, a steel cut oat is like cracked wheat. It's just uh, they've taken the little oat grain and then, uh, yeah, oat grain, and then just kind of cracked it up as opposed to a flake is smashed and flattened out, so it cooks faster. Steel cut oats take a long time to cook, and that's, you know, the flake is much handier. And, um, and, and that's, you know, and then the instant, they've actually even manipulated a little bit more. So all that carbohydrate is just 
more available. The steel cut is just more fibery. My favorite word. <laughs> and mushier. When I cooked it, I did not like the consistency. It's a totally different consistency. We're used to our oatmeal flakes. The steel cut, oh, well, it's, yeah, it's a job to cook and it's a lot of chewing, but, you know, it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, we got a, okay, we have time for another question. Uh, the instant oatmeal, if you just use the plain instant oatmeal without the sugar and the fruit and all the other stuff that's in it, is that still That's what they were using. Is that still high? Yeah. It's still high. It's still instant. Yeah. Um, she wants to know the can or the frozen beans. It, or is there a difference between oh, canned beans and kidney? frozen beans? Yeah. And well, in, in like what? Cooked. And cooked. Oh, no. Cooked yeah. beans, fine. Yeah, because yeah. they, they It's still pretty low. Well, they couldn't get... Yeah, they wouldn't be able to get those folks to eat uncooked beans, but uh, <laughs> I think... I don't know if they ate four and a half cups of carrots. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. But when you shop for canned beans, you just have to be a real sleuth, you know, because all the... Popular stuff is eye level, you know, it's your ranch style, your baked beans. If you want the beans, and I mean, canned beans are fine. Somebody else has already cooked them. That's kind of handy. Uh, but you have to read your ingredient label to make sure they haven't added stuff, sugar, primarily. You know, if they add jalapenos, that's kind of up to personal choice. But yeah, <clears throat> there's got. <laughs> What's your thought? I've, I've heard of some people, they try to mix the, like say they go moderate GL and then they mix it with the low GL, they combine it in a, in a meal. Yeah. Any thought on that? It, you know, when you combine things, you, you will kind of, <clears throat> I, I guess in a way gets kind of an average. The thing is, those, those more moderate and high glycemic load foods are, are very often non-whole foods, meaning, you know, they're processed and, you know, starchy stuff, just low food value. It's going to make that insulin go up, you know, make our body want to sock away little fat molecules, <clears throat> which most of us don't want any more of. And um, so, the con you know, eating any kind of carbohydrate with fat and protein in the same meal or, you know, loading up your potato with sour cream and things like that and eating it with protein will blunt, you know, what your blood sugar does because fat's the last thing that eat, leaves the stomach, so that's going to slow down your whole digestion. So have a steak with it, yeah. Um, I've been told that a high glycemic diet will cause you to accumulate in your midriff. Uh, does a low glycemic diet affect that? Well, it's all part of the metabolic process that goes on with the high glycemic uh, being a real insulin stimulator. And when you've got a lot of insulin stimulation going on, it tends to uh, prevent the body from breaking down your own body fat, and, and it may even store away more body fat. Now, it's going to depend on person to person, you know, how much th that corresponds to where their body fat goes. But as a rule of thumb, it is going to be much, much kinder to your insulin levels if you go the low glycemic load. Yeah, because they were pretty successful with those folks, those teens that had, you know, insulin resistance, which means they had already had high insulin levels. And when they put them on that low glycemic load, they lost body fat. And the regular folks didn't so much, but they did. So that was good for them. The preceding program was presented by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International in the Bright Spot for Health Lunch Lecture Series. To inquire about additional health-related information available on DVD, audio CD, VHS, or audio cassette, simply call 316-682-3100 or drop by 3100 North Hillside in Wichita, Kansas. To discover more about the center and what we have to offer, be sure and visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.